Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. Welcome to another episode of the podcast Flavors Unknown, the only place where you can listen from celebrity chefs to up and coming chefs, pastry chefs, and mixologists sharing the latest industry trends and what makes them successful. I am your host, Emmanuel Laroche. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you are a first time listener, welcome to the show. I have been in the food industry for more than 20 years both in Europe and in the US. And every other week, if you decide to subscribe to this podcast, you will be part of a group of privileged people able to hear directly from top chefs and mixologists from various backgrounds. The website is flavorsunknown.com and you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Flavors Unknown. My guest last week was the home cook and writer Ted Lee from the Lee Brothers. And on this episode, we discuss about what makes a successful cookbook and dive into their new book called Hotbox on high-end catering. Quick question. Have you ever wondered how to revamp a cocktail program or how to go about reinventing a classic cocktail? Well, on today's episode, this is exactly what you'll find out with my guest, the award-winning bar director, Beau Dubois. He recently moved to the south of California as the new bar and spirit creative director at Puesto in San Diego. He built his 16 years career in LA at the Corner Door and in Napa Valley at the three Michelin star restaurant Midwood. Hi, Bo. Thank you very much for being a guest on Flavors Unknown. I'm really excited to have uh, another mixologist, you know, on the show. Oh, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, really, 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 really honored that you guys reached out. You're welcome. So let's jump into it. So, you know, reading everything that you have done, and it seems that you have done everything, you know, from tiki cocktails to theme cocktail menus to creating cocktails for a three Michelin star restaurant. So if you are looking back at your career, how would you describe the way how you create cocktails? Are you doing it from what we say, like top down or bottom up? So meaning like, are you thinking first of an overarching flavors or theme? And then you are looking at all the details, you know, to come up with the drink? Or are you building it like step by steps, you know, from one ingredient at a time? You know, for me, it starts with the base spirit. Then it becomes more about the overarching flavor that I'm going for. And then it moves into kind of the visual, visual experience. You know, what is that? How does that cocktail make a guest feel when it gets dropped down in front of them? And also, how does that visual presentation basically elevate the experience that that guest has with that cocktail? You know, so like, for instance, meaning like, I don't... Uh, don't tend to want to like just arbitrarily garnish something with just for it to look better. I want it to have an, a, an impact on the experience of the cocktail as well. Whether it's in a garnish that provides an aromatic characteristic, that way it's elevating and it's part of it. It's another component of the drink. But one thing that should be also like I always I always advocate for is you know make sure that you're listening to your to your neighborhood and to your guest when it comes to building cocktails and creating cocktails. I think that a lot of bartenders, uh, and mixologists, I think that they fall into the trap of you know, like trying to win those magazine covers or constantly pushing boundaries. And like, that's really, really, really great. But, you know, honestly, like, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of cocktail critics that come in, they kind of drink for free. They're not really going to help always keep your, your bills paid. You know, your neighborhood helps you keep the bills paid. Making sure that you're not leaving the neighborhood behind is very important to me. Okay, so can you give us an example, maybe a practical example, taking one of, uh, you know, a drink that you have created and the way how you you built it, you know, from like the base spirits and then, um, you know, looking at the overall arching flavors and that would be great. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we did a, a passion fruit margarita riff for the, the last menu I did at the, the restaurant at Meadowood. 
you know, passion fruit margarita, that's just, that's kind of like a, a, a real layup in terms of, you know, cocktail making because put passion fruit in anything and people are going to order it, you know, and that's what I really appreciate that about that. But we, I wanted to take it further so that the passion fruit wasn't very super polarizing because that's also a problem with passion fruit is that sometimes all you're going to taste is passion fruit. And that's uh, not always a bad thing, but in terms of making interesting cocktails, I think it can be. And so we were able to really go down the rabbit hole and make sure that we were basically helping the passion fruit calm down. And then that included using like a really big body tequila with a little bit of green tea as well to kind of soften it on the palate. And then the glass was pre-seasoned with a, a ginger salt mist. And that was very important to me because that ginger also helped kind of calm down the passion fruit and pull it in a different direction while keeping it balanced. But it also made sure that every sip, that last little lick on the lips, had a little bit of a salt characteristic to it so that it just kind of felt very, very thoughtful as well. So what, what drew you, uh, you to uh, Mixology? You know, I started bartending when I was 21. I got hired on accident at a little cocktail bar in Indiana, in Muncie, Indiana, where I went to school at Ball State University. And what drew me to it was there was a lot of history to not only bartending, but just hospitality in that regard. And you're mostly getting to experience people kind of at their happiest. You know, they've had a long day. They need a cocktail. You're the person making the cocktail. So you're their hero. They're celebrating something. And so, again, you get to be a part of that. You know, you also at times, of course, I'll, you know, act as a the psychologist at the bar. But for me, the recipes and being able to feel that that sense of accomplishment when a guest is is actually surprised at how much they enjoy the cocktail. And I think that's what kind of drew me to it was, you know, you're always wanting to put your own touch on something and, and go a little extra. And when you see your guests' eyes light up because they themselves perceive that little extra and what it did to better the cocktail, I think that's that's what drew me to it and keeps me going. Can you describe a little bit what are like the step when you are creating an immersive bar experience, you know, for the consumers? I mean, in terms of immersive bar experience, just everything, you know. When we opened Corner Door, we made it very much about neighborhood and comfortability. And it goes down everything down to what kind of playlist you're playing, you know, and we listen to the neighborhood in regards to that, as well as, you know, we made sure that it's, you know, it's a place that young kids are going to hang out at, but also people of all ages are going to hang out. But we also made sure that like women that were hanging out with their, their other women friends weren't just being like constantly approached by single men. You know, we, we made sure to even keep an eye on that, you know, and make sure that everybody's feeling comfortable. So that it doesn't sell out to that kind of a crowd, if that makes sense. People rely on it and they're like, wow, they're, they're really thoughtful with the cocktails. They're really thoughtful with their decor and, and the music and they're thoughtful with their guest experience. You know, and that to me is very, very important characteristic of a neighborhood bar. What's the motivation that uh, you had when you started creating theme cocktails menu? At, so let's say the, the corner door, was it the fact that because most of the cocktails menu that we see around the country are driven typically by, you know, seasonality? So is it the idea to get away from this and to have like a different entry point into a cocktail menu when you did like um, Alice in Wonderland or like the Goonies or Stephen King's themes menus? Yeah, it was it was exactly that, exactly what you just said, which was that most everyone else is doing cocktails that are driven by, you know, this is our spring menu. This is our summer menu or winter menu or our fall menu. It just started to feel like white noise to me, uh, especially in California. Like, obviously, we have seasons here in California, but <laughs> it's mostly yeah. sunny, sunny all the time. Right. And so to kind of be like, here's our hot toddy, even though it's 75 degrees out, you know. And so certainly can just because you're doing menus at different times, it doesn't mean that you can't use ingredients of the season and incorporate those. But to keep saying to people, hey, come check out our winter menu, come check. There's 30 winter menus launching tonight. The theme menus allowed me to have way more fun with it, tell a bigger story 
and also kind of go back to what we were just talking about, which is provide another level of an immersive experience. Here's why they named it this. Here's why they use these ingredients. You know, for the Alice in Wonderland menu, we did a, a cognac sour variation using um, marsala and carrots. And so people were able to point to those things and then and then get a kick out of the name, which was a bunch of time. I'm guessing that if you are taking like the example of like the Alice in Wonderland, that, uh, you know, some of the source of inspiration comes from the different aspects, you know, of the book and, uh, you know, the story. But at the same time, I'm guessing like from a, a structure of a bar menu, you need to have a wide spread of cocktail, I would say styles, you know, for your customers. So how do you manage to balance, you know, both the fact that it's probably different spirits, different strengths, you know, and uh, of alcohol? Again, that goes back to kind of listening to your neighborhood, you know, and so it starts there. Okay. Neighborhood in Culver City, for instance, for the Alice in Wonderland, you know, they're, they're always going to love whiskey, but, you know, it's great to like make sure that there's something, keep things light and refreshing and have a balance of refreshing versus aromatic cocktails. But you also kind of want to be giving ingredients a different context so that, for instance, with like the bunch of thyme, which was a carrot sour, we could have easily made that a whiskey cocktail. But we wanted to showcase what the cognac would do paired with the carrot and flavor. And we found that to be so much more profound than whiskey. They both played well, but the cognac was so much more dynamic. You know, so you're you're giving people a, a like a reason to step out of their comfort zone just ever so slightly as opposed to like kind of middle fingering them and being like well this is our so tall menu and it's all so tall and that's all we're going to do because we're a so tall bar you know and it's like that's great but you're kind of cutting off your nose to spite your face would a theme menu allows you to be uh, more creative and think almost like, uh, you know, more outside of the box? Uh, can you be more adventurous, even if you have to keep in mind, of course, the business, you know, aspect and to make sure that you are going to sell those, those drinks? Is it a, a more exciting, let's say, uh, platform for more creativity? Of course, it's, it gives you both the opportunity and the challenge of, of more creativity. And but you always have to stay one foot in the is this viable for this business and for this neighborhood? If I had open corner door with an Alice in Wonderland menu, or if I if I immediately came into this new challenge and project with Questo and did something like that, I might fall on deaf ears. First and foremost, you're, you build viable programs, then you earn the trust of your of your community and your demographic, and then once you have that, that's when it's like, okay, now it's time to innovate. Now it's time to do something. You can always hang out in this zone of cocktails, this ten to fourteen dollars zone of cocktails. Or they're also offering some of their immersive cocktails, which are at a higher price point, but tell much more of the story. After that, you, mo you moved to a three Michelin star restaurant. So can you explain to us how is it different to create a drink menu at a three Michelin star restaurant compared to, you know, another, another place, another bar? There are things that are, that are different about it. And there, there are things that, that really aren't. You're still, for instance, you're still offering a balanced menu through refreshing and aromatic cocktails and, and a variety of, of spirits. And vodka drinks will always kind of come in a certain format for certain demographics, as well as whiskey will always kind of come in a certain format as well. Some of the advantages, for instance, I had one of the sous chefs was a full-time forager. And so that person and I worked together almost daily on the things the produce and agriculture that he was finding throughout his foraging full time in Napa. He would be able to come to me very often with, hey, I found these almond blossoms of the first flower of spring, you know, here in Napa. What can you do with them? That's a lot different than like just having to having to schlep across LA to go to the farmer's market sure. to try to grab what everybody else can grab. So access to like unique and, and refined, you know, ingredients. Aside from that, just access to the palates of some of the best chefs in the country, including Chef Costell, you know, who would be passing through the restaurant while we were setting up. And I was able to constantly pull on his palate and ask him what he thinks, you know, and that that's a that's a resource that is completely invaluable. So you have this so you're talking about this collaboration between you behind the bar and, and the chef in the kitchen. So. 
Uh, how has uh, food influenced your cocktail creation at, at that place? It presented a, a really great opportunity, which was here is a here is a a, a demographic that is very wine focused, is but also they're in Napa and they're vacationing, and so sometimes they're also very wine exhausted, and so if there was an opportunity to get a cocktail in front of them, which was very often in the beginning, to set them up for success and get them thinking already in kind of a a subtle and thoughtful sort of approach to our, our cocktail making, but also get ready for some of the greatest food that you've ever had in your life from Chef Costow and his team. It, it just set the tone for the evening. And then when there was a challenge for them to skip the wine pairing and do a cocktail pairing throughout their whole meal, I mean, just imagine as a bartender, you're you're looking at 14 courses of Chef Costow's cooking that you need to pair a cocktail with. And it starts now, right now. <laughs> wow. How do you do that? It's, I mean, it's by spending a lot of time with, with Chef Costow and his team and, and tasting things, tasting the dishes, tasting the ingredients, spending time at the farm as well. And, and then using, leaning onto your, you know, your long standing career and, and tasting <laughs> spirits and cocktails. You know, and so if you if you have an appreciation for that and you can combine that with all those other contributing factors, then it really just comes down to creating that pairing. And uh, and when you create that pairing in that situation, are you looking at uh, creating a cocktail that will complement uh, like the dish or are you sometime leveraging some of uh, maybe some savory uh, components that you can find in the dish in order to um, structure your cocktail with? The way that I would always typically approach it is a balance of uh, complementary and contrasting. Okay, so overly complementary is where you're using the same ingredients or similar flavors in the cocktail to the dish. But for me, that that's just kind of too much. That's a little excessive. For me, it's more important to offer a little bit of contrast so that we're helping to reset the palate. We're also greatly pleasing the palate for where the food has left it after its last bite or the first bite. But also, when you go back for another bite, it's very reminiscent of the first bite. Now you have recently joined Puesto in San Diego. So I'm curious about which road brought you to work with uh, this you know, Mexican restaurant. Because it's like really different from what you you know you have done before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and I think that that's a big reason for it is you know when they approached me and uh, one of the founders, uh, Alex Adler, of the three brothers that founded Puesto, he reached out to me on Instagram and he just you know he spoke very highly of how much admiration they had for the restaurant at Meadowood and the Meadowood Resort and for Michelin in, in general and kind of walked me through what they were hoping to do. The more research that I did on both him as well as Puesto and looking at their business model, and I just realized that I'm never going to have an opportunity if I can, like this, if I continue on the trajectory that I'm on now, which is I'm averaging, I'm able to train five or six bartenders a year at best. Now with this opportunity, I get to train over a hundred bartenders. That's a hundred more opportunities of having an impact on young, potentially professional or current professional bartenders, not only can I teach, but also definitely learn things from as well. And being able to have your cocktails at that many locations offers a lot of challenges based on programming and consistency and science. <laughs> Honestly, it's just another frontier to bring elevated cocktails to an already thriving business. You know, the restaurant at Meadowood what is very thriving, you know, but they wanted to elevate their cocktail program. To me, it's just the same thing here. But now I have multiple locations and I have the challenge of that kind of consistency in, in execution for each cocktail that I, put, that I put out as opposed to, oh, oh, I'll be behind the bar tonight. So the cocktails, of course, will be exactly how I want them to be. No, I mean, this time there's going to be bartenders in Northern California while I'm down in Southern California or vice versa every night, every lunch. And I'm going to be getting feedback on that at all times of the day. 
And so I just looked at it, I was like, this is a challenge that I, I've never heard a bartender taking. So uh, how many locations do you have? We're working on, I believe, our sixth location for, for California, but there'll be nine locations by this time next year. And then I believe 12 locations by in two years. So you have been asked, obviously, to revamp the, the cocktail program. So how, how do you start something like this? That's, that is a, that's a, a great question in terms of you want to take your time and you want to come at it the right way. You look at some of their, their sales reports. You look at their, their Instagram and you start correlating the things that are already working, the flavors that are already working, the types and formats that are already working. And you're just like, okay. This isn't about like ripping the rug out from underneath the program. It's about just kind of taking quarter turns on the things that are the cocktails that are already doing so well and just elevating them ever so slightly so that you don't leave those guests in the dark just because they don't like aloe vera or hammering. It's about just quarter turning that recipe and turning the volume up a little bit. So they're like, I like the old one, but this one is, is getting better, you know? And those are the trust. That's the trust that you earn from guests so that. Maybe they will come back in a month or two months and try that crazy cocktail at the bottom of the menu. But then the other side of it is looking at things that really don't work, you know, or haven't worked historically and in, in offering something new that, again, listening to the neighborhood, you feel like is going to be a success or is going to start to tell a story. So how do you, how do you balance the fact that, uh, you know, you have like six, uh, soon nine locations and you have, you know, a, a program with that you are restructuring and you, you want to have like all the bartenders and all the location to deliver the same consistency of the drinks. But are you customizing, you know, some of the menus and some location compared to others? Going back to what you were saying, you know, I, at, at the beginning of uh, the recording uh, that was about that it, it is very important to understand your neighborhood. And, and create something connected to the neighborhood. I'm guessing the neighborhood in the northern part of California or where you're in San Diego is relatively different. So how do you balance those two things? Right now, the first phase is getting a new menu out for every location, but that's certainly something that we talk about daily and it's something that they've already been doing with their food. Certain places have certain items based on where they're located and what the neighborhood is hungry for or thirsty for. And so eventually it will become that that you'll see certain offerings cocktail wise and food wise at individual Puesto locations based on what works for them in that neighborhood. So now you're in San Diego, you were in Napa before and in LA. So how would you describe the San Diego, let's say bar or cocktail scene in comparison to the two other locations? The Well, in comparison to, I'd have to compare it first to, to Napa, just to kind of go in chronological backwards order. But to Napa, you know, Napa is, is a beautiful place to visit and the tourism is wonderful there. And to live there is to be a part of that industry constantly. You're, you are surrounded by all hospitality professionals for the most part or, or farmers. It's a much quieter pace of life. Incredible food, obvious, obviously incredible wine. I don't drink too much wine, but I can certainly appreciate it. I think I was there to kind of be that that cocktail resource that when people were wine exhausted. But again, it's 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 really it was really an honor to be surrounded by the level of professional food and beverage career individuals of of that kind of caliber. You know, these people are it's like being called up to the Yankees. You know what I mean? But again, a much in comparison to LA and comparison to San Diego much slower pace of life. The one thing that I was really kind of bummed out about was not a lot of Asian cuisine in Napa. But it, Napa has a lot of fine dining for sure. Napa could use for some more like high-end casual, I would say. And I know Chef Costell has uh, Charter Oak and that, that does definitely scratch that itch. That's one of the best restaurants in the country for sure. But in terms of going out for like some ramen or some sushi, that's not really happening in Napa. In Napa. <laughs> And then San Diego, in comparison to to Napa, I mean, San Diego is is just a a wonderful community full of people who really love what they're doing in terms of hospitality. They're not just doing it because they're hoping to get rich off of it, because you won't. 
but they they love what they do they're doing they love their city they love their community and they're constantly constantly pushing to learn and support each other and that, that's i've only been living here since october and i've already noticed that in, in spades and so in comparison to to los angeles Los Angeles has the movie industry, it has the music industry. It's just difficult to balance a staff of people that some people on that staff might be there to do other things. I insist that if we're bartending together, that you're treating it like a profession as well. That's a hard thing to accomplish in Los Angeles. But LA, LA deserves a lot of credit. You know, they've been overlooked as a city from a lot of awards, foundations. You know, I think that that's a shame. And unfortunately, I think it's taken its toll on Los Angeles. And now the industry is trying to reinvent itself a little bit. But San Diego to me just feels like it feels like the little brother of LA that's just been watching you get in trouble for things. It's like, I'm not gonna do that when I'm his age, you know, or nope, I'm gonna do this instead. And so it feels like on so many different levels, San Diego has learned to try to be better in terms of the cocktail industry here in, in San Diego uh, to Los Angeles. So I know all my Los Angeles friends are going to hate me for saying that, but they can come <laughs> stay with me in San Diego anytime they want and I'll show them around. But it's also San Diego is beautiful. It's, it's much safer and cleaner city, much more friendly community all around. Let's come back a little bit to your creative process. How do you go about reinventing like a classic cocktail? Well, in, uh, in terms of reinventing a classic cocktail, let's let's just take a uh, let's go for the the low hanging fruit. And let's talk about old fashions. Old fashioned, just a combination of a base spirit, bitters, and sugar. You know, and obviously it was historically usually made with whiskey. And uh, at a time when bars were just beginning to have creative menus, and uh, people would come back and say, "Can I have the whiskey cocktail the old fashioned way?" And that's where the name was born. So you look at those those building blocks of that cocktail. Okay, whiskey sugar, bitters, okay, or, or any base spirit. There's a lot of room to play there, okay? First and foremost, just looking at, all right, let's take the bourbon out, let's put in cognac, or let's take the bourbon out or the rye out, let's put in tequila, or let's do a split of cognac and rye. And then, okay, let's start to look at the sugar. Now, the sugar is just a, it's just a vehicle for some, some richness, some softness to the cocktail, but that sugar is made with water, which is flavorless. Doesn't need to be flavorless. Why instead of water, just use tea, or steep some fruit in that water, or in, infuse the sugar with some fruit, some peels uh, of of various citruses, and go from there. Okay, so now you've already greatly changed that cocktail to something that's a little close to a fingerprint of flavor that you were going for, but it still scratches the itch of someone who's looking for that old fashioned. And then you can play as well with the different bitters, correct? Of course, yeah. The bitters, I mean, that's, there's, we live in a time where I'd be shocked if you could find a flavor that isn't in a bitters right now, <laughs> you know? True. True. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure somebody's got a peanut butter bitters out there, you know? And I'll try <laughs> it. I'll drink it. And let's keep like this, uh, focusing on the old fashioned. So what kind of an uh, amateur like bartender at home can prepare you know, with a, maybe like a unique and, and a new, uh, let's say, old fashioned with a, with a twist. What would you sure. suggest? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would say head to the decent liquor store in your town or down the street from your house and, and grab some apple brandy and grab a bottle of cognac. And let's just do one ounce of each. Let's do like a uh, uh, let's get a little bit of apple cider. And we're going to use the cider instead of water to make the simple syrup. So just equal parts there. And then just put a little bit of uh, cherry and an orange bitters in there. And you got a Thanksgiving Day old fashioned right there. Very cool. Where do you turn to when, it, you know, for inspiration, when you want to create something new, which is like outside of the classic cocktail now? So what's, what's, what's your source of inspirations? Yeah, you know, it's it's always different, but for me, yeah, I have to admit, honestly, I use I use a lot of uh, various food menus cookbooks. You'll see see me crack into um, some Votaggio cookbooks and look at some of his his fruit fruit ingredients and how they impact a savory dish. Some spice combinations. I'll open, obviously, you'll see me crack Death and Co's cocktail book almost twice a day. I just think that it's 
one of the best cocktail books on the planet. But in terms of like my own inspiration always just comes from what are we going for here? What is the tone that we're trying to strike? And balancing that with, again, back to like, what is the neighborhood looking for? What have they enjoyed? And what is, what are some, some seasonal ingredients that can be incorporated in this? Some local ingredients. What's a, how can we tell a bigger story here? But that being said, there's countless bartenders that inspire me every day. Mike Lay, David Purcell, and so many other ones. And so most of the time I just pull up what they're working on or go try some of their cocktails, hang out with them for a little bit and see what tickles me. And so when talking about what tickles you and then, you know, kind of like new ingredients. So do you have at the moment something that you're obsessed with, like a unique or unfamiliar flavors that's finding your way into your cocktail menu? Like I said, kind of when I was describing that passion fruit cocktail that we did for the restaurant in Meadowood is making different flavored salts, salines. And just like with simple syrup, it's, you know, you're going to make a saline with a combination of water and salt. Well, one of those ingredients doesn't have any flavor. So why not flavor that? Okay, because that flavor is going to grab to the salt and the salt is going to sit on the surface of the drink and... It's going to ensure that if you're looking for a salt component, for instance, like in a margarita, every sip is going to be the equal amount of salt as opposed to uh, this bartender like over salt of the glass. And so all they're going to taste is salt for 25 seconds and then they're going to hopefully taste, co taste a cocktail. But play around with salines as well. And, and it doesn't mean that the drink has to be salty. It doesn't even mean that the guest has to perceive salt in the cocktail. But just like anything, it's going to increase flavor just like it does with food. Is it an ingredient that tends to be overused? Much like burning an orange peel over the surface of a drink. Yeah. Let's make sure that it's the right context. Do you look into like science, um, you know, when it comes to cocktail making, when it comes to, um, you know, specific reaction between different ingredients, but as well, maybe some of the tools that uh, are available nowadays. So are you playing with those things or not, not really? The only thing that I really play around with is just a, a refractometer. That's something that I've, is new to Puesto that I'm, I've incorporated because if I change the recipe uh, for a, an in-house cordial or a syrup and I'm not there to train them on it, but they have the recipe, they have it broken down line by line, step by step by myself with pictures to guide them, I still can't be there to make sure that they didn't cook it for too long or too little. And so the refractometer acts as uh, measuring the sugar in, in any liquid. I could even say, hey, Puesto's perfect margarita is this many bricks. That means this is how sweet the cocktail should be when it's correct. And so even if it's obviously we're striving for balance here, not sweet cocktails, but sugar is a part of all cocktails. So what I'm saying is even the managers in a Puesto up in Northern California can walk by and check the bricks on a syrup that's being made or a, or a cocktail that's being made. And before they even need to taste it, they can say, this is right or this is wrong. So thinking about like um, your new menus that you put together at uh, Puesto, what is the cocktail that you has, you are the most proud of? Well, uh, we I was looking at the sales and I I was really really surprised by how many margaritas they sell, just classic margaritas as well as Cadillac margaritas. And I was talking talking to my wife about that and uh, a spirit brand that I I really enjoy called Coda Go Tequila. They're having a lot of success with a a pink blanco tequila, which is They're, they're Blanco that's kind of finished uh, for a few weeks in some wine barrels from Napa. And it just kind of made me think. I was like, well, the only thing better than one Cadillac is two Cadillacs. And the only thing better than a regular <laughs> Cadillac is a pink Cadillac. Yeah, that's true. And so, <laughs> and so I just thought about like Puesto and its, its demographic and its neighborhood. And, you know, it was actually my wife who came up with the name. And I was like, oh, that's actually like a really good idea. It's It's kind of like you always want to like feel like you're giving people kind of what they want and you want to have fun with that. You know, you don't you read, hey, a three Michelin star bartender took over Puesto. Okay, now the drinks are all going to be like super dorky and nerdy and academic. <laughs> yes. It's like, no, how about we just do a pink Cadillac with some uh, pink tequila, a little bit of fresh lime, some agave, some Grand Marnier that I've infused with hibiscus and some rhubarb. Hmm. Pink Cadillac. Wow. wow. You know, and Very it's, cool. It, 
it's also you have a visual appeal. Like the one of those goes out in a night where all we're selling is, is Puesto margaritas and Cadillac margaritas. The pink Cadillac goes out and what happens is, what's that? I want that. Actually, I don't care what that is. I just want it. Let's do it. I got to get a picture of that. And it's the pink Cadillac. Oh, that's adorable. You know? So I was, you know, it doesn't always have to be the cocktail that you put a, a, do- a doctorate theory to, you know, sometimes it's just the one that you're like, this is really fun and it tastes great. In what way uh, would you say that Instagram changed your way of, um, of creating cocktails? Instagram, we, we live in the world of Instagram now. We live in the world of pictures and people taste with their eyes. And that's, that's a part of it, you know, and if you can't evolve as a chef or a bartender and understand how to use that to your advantage, then you're sleeping at the wheel. But that being said, should it be guided by, by Instagram? Not necessarily. And it's, again, goes back to what I said is like, don't just make something look like it for just the picture. Make sure that there, there is a connection between the flavor and balance of the cocktail to the actual presentation and also the history of that cocktail. So, but it always has to be in consideration. You know, you're hoping that people will provide that free advertising for you because they're so excited by what their collectible experience is, is that they don't, they could easily repost one of our professionally taken photographs onto their own feed, right? But that doesn't make it a collectible experience. The collectible experience is they're like, they see the professional photo on our feed and they say, hey, I got to go get that cocktail and get my picture with that cocktail. So that my followers can see that I am out and I'm pursuing my own happiness and pursuing the things that I love. And I'm sharing it with them and my audience as well. And uh, there's going to be um, pictures of pink Cadillacs everywhere now. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be pictures of me holding the pink Cadillac everywhere. <laughs> okay, very yeah. good. Yeah. Even better. <laughs> yeah, I'll be drinking that every night I'm in a puesta. We have been talking for, um, you know, about 40 minutes. So um, I, I'm really um, glad that we had uh, the possibility of this conversation. But I would like to finish with a series of uh, rapid fire questions, if sure. you don't mind. Yeah, well, absolutely. Sounds fun. So are you uh, more uh, like tequila or mezcal? Mezcal. Mezcal? Why? The mezcal for me has, uh, it tells a, a little bit more of a, a dynamic flavor story. I enjoy the the just slightly ever so more intense craftsmanship that goes into mezcal making. And I see the art in its production. What is the cheekiest cocktail that you have ever invented? Oh, it was called Grandma's Pack of Cigarettes. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> yeah, it was called Grandma's Pack of Cigarettes. It was, uh, it was a cocktail that had, it was a Manhattan that had like almost a spicy kind of umami characteristic to it. It's like one of those things that you discover like by like screwing up a cocktail. And you're like, whoa, that's something about that. You know, like you just keep kind of coming back to it. You're like, oh, that's intense. You know what I mean? I don't know what to make of it, but I have to try it again. You know, it just reminded me of like the first time you snuck up like a cigarette from your grandma's purse and you smoke it out back and you're like, <laughs> oh, that was terrible. I hated that. But then like a week later, you're like, I kind of want another one. You know, it does that to you. <laughs> that's why we call it grandma's pack of cigarettes. What is your favorite drink to make? Vucre. Besides the pink Cadillac. Besides Sorry, the pink Cadillac. It's the pink Cadillac. Uh, it's, uh, it's the 1949 uh, New Orleans Hotel Monteleon, the, the Vieux Carré. Uh, they asked the bartender to make a cocktail that embodied the French Quarter. And Vieux Carré means Old Square, which is how we referred to the French Quarter until we got too lazy and just called it the French Quarter. But it's a combination of fry, cognac, sweet vermouth, Benedictine, and some Peychaud bitters. Some people like Fodango in oh, it. Wow. I don't. Yeah, but the thing, the key is a twist of lemon, not an orange twist of lemon. What do you think are going to be the cocktail trends in 2020? I think that you're going to be seeing a lot of people that are going to be focusing their hospitable deliverable assets, as well as the balance of their cocktails, uh, as opposed to what I described earlier, which was people kind of just chasing fame. I think people are starting to kind of calm down into their bartending careers and people are starting to look at it or have been looking at it more as something that they can do for the rest of their life and and live a life that's built around creating flavor. And so people taking it seriously in a way that's more directed towards the guest rather than their own self-servitude. There's a lot of things that goes into uh, the business, you know, of um, 
managing a bar and so on. And, uh, and of course, marketing aspect is very important. So from your experience, uh, can you share with us a great marketing bar idea that, uh, you know, you used, I'm, I mean, recently or in the past? I think it happens in March. A few years ago at Cornador, we, we got to the day in that Back to the Future Part 2 is, is the day and the year that he goes to in the future, you know, where there's flying cars and hoverboards, of course, which there yeah, are none, yeah, of, yeah, yeah, none yeah. of now. And so they were like, oh, it's Back to the Future Day. I was like, oh, that's great. And one of my bartenders was like, we should throw a party. And I'm like, because we were all nerds. We, are, we still are. And I was like, we have like four, five hours before we open. And they're like, no, let's just get everybody involved. Everybody will be responsible for something. And like, you just like start coming up with recipes and, and coming up with names and start Instagramming like crazy. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I'm into it because just give me a reason to dress up like Marty McFly, you know, and I'm there. <laughs> but it was, it was a supremely busy night. People were, we, we had the movies playing and people were quoting it. People were ordering the, like, we had like four or six different Back to the Future cocktails. And it was just like bananas, bananas. Oh, wow. But I will say again, okay. like we were talking about it earlier, is like the themed menus really, if you really commit to it, really, really commit to it, like the theme menus are a huge tool, huge tool. You know, you have been recently in San Diego, so I don't know if you had the time to explore a little bit uh, there. But uh, where, where do you go to enjoy a drink, you know, where you are not behind the bar or, of course, not at Puesto? Right, right, yeah. It's without questions, hands down, one spot in this whole city that is the only place that I've been to now probably more than 10 times since I've lived here in October and moved here in October. And it's Jay and Tony's fine meats and, and Negroni warehouse. Jay and T's is putting out some of the best cocktails in San Diego, hands down. And it's a new form, it's a new format of the bar experience. And when you are greeted with a small little uh, ramekin of aged Parmesan while you peruse the menu, you're already thinking this place is I'm in love with it. And they just if they try to keep me away, they're going to fail miserably. But it was Very cool. Uh, if you're in San Diego, please, please, please check it out. Please keep in mind that they they close early around like eight or nine. Sometimes, you know, it's more of a day drinking spot. But OK, some of the best cocktails. In Nothing the city. wrong with that. <laughs> So, yeah, in fact, I'm, I'm going to be in San Diego uh, beginning of March. So I will definitely first reach out to you. And I think it would be great to Please. get together. And then uh, I will try that spot as well. Please. Definitely. So both, thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you very much to, uh, for being a guest on Favors Unknown. It was uh, really excited to, to have you. Oh, great. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast, Flavors Unknown. I know there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I am deeply honored that you decided to listen to mine. If you like this episode, you can find the show notes at flavorsunknown.com, where you can find all the links and everything mentioned in this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast and share it with a foodie friend or a colleague. And one more thing, please rate and review the podcast on your app. In two weeks, my guest will be Houston most recognizable chef Chris Shefford from Underbelly, UB Preserve, and One Fifth to mention some of his restaurants. And he's the author of the recent cookbook, Cook Like a Local. Do you have questions for Chef Chris Shefford? Please send them to me at the following email address, contact at flavorsunknown.com, and I will include some of them in my conversation with Chef Shepherd. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. You've just enjoyed another delicious episode of Flavors Unknown. Hungry for more? Hit subscribe. Tell us where you're listening from by leaving a review. And for social media and show notes, head to flavorsunknown.com.